Welcome to Myco Minute, conversations about collaboration brought to you by the capacity creators at Myco Consulting LLC, where we help higher ed, nonprofit, and philanthropic leaders advance the initiatives they care about most. Hey, this is Deb Mashik, and today I am speaking with Faisal Al-Mutar, who is a social entrepreneur and founder of the organization Ideas Beyond Borders. It's a nonprofit dedicated to empowering people across the globe with access to new ideas and fresh perspectives. And Faisal also received the President's Volunteer Service Award from Barack Obama and is a fellow at the Elevate Prize Foundation. So before we um, jump in, I have to give you a huge note of gratitude for two reasons. Well, I could probably do about a million, but we'll start with two. One is that you are on Michael's advisory board. So thank you for that. And two, it was over margaritas about four months ago that you suggested, hey, you know, maybe some informal conversations with these uh, amazing people, including, you didn't say you, but anyway, it was your idea that I could have these conversations with people on the board to talk about collaboration and to help bring a little uh, awareness to the challenges, the opportunities. So thank you. Thank you. And I'm, I'm so happy to see, to see your interviewing more and more interesting people. I'm so glad. I mean, sometimes good ideas come over margaritas. So that's one of the, I mean, like maybe 1% of the ideas go over margaritas good, but, but this is one of, one of them. Yeah. So and I think this was margarita number two that this idea came up with. <laughs> you know, the number of good ideas perhaps uh, are correlated with the number of margaritas. <laughs> definitely, definitely. So for those who don't know you, I'm wondering if you can tell us a bit about your, your story because it's, it's fascinating, it's powerful. Um, what should we know about you? Uh, definitely. I mean, I, I, uh, I grew up in uh, Iraq, so I was born uh, uh, during the regime of Saddam Hussein. And then the, the U.S. war or the Iraq war happened in 2003. And um, I think the most interesting part, I think it's really the most relevant to the, this conversation is that, and that's really, I would say, generated my great interest in, in the subject of education, subject of information in particular, is that we moved from two, two sources of information. We had a controlled mechanism in which the state is the main source of the information. And then we moved from that to a thousand channels and we moved from, I compress, like we moved from 1984 to Brave New World within a year, <laughs> in which we want, moved from state controlled truth to, um, in which we don't know what's true anymore. So my, my crazy self, um, when, when my na- neighborhood I used to live in, my dad is a medical doctor, and we moved to Baghdad, uh, to an area that most of the people used to live there was Saddam Hussein's generals. So when the war happened, our area became empty, and the houses that used to be the, the generals became the places for Al Qaeda headquarters in, 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 in the west part of Baghdad. And this is really where my journey uh, started in, in uh, speaking out uh, against this form of, form of extremism, but also try to create a positive change by bringing people together. So I was the hipster of, of Baghdad <laughs> uh, <laughs> in, in, in terms of uh, why don't everybody get along? Uh, and, and so as a result of that, um, and really be, me becoming part of, of a movement that was speaking out against it, we started becoming targeted one by one. And eventually, unfortunately, I ended up on a local death list. Well, who's, in my, yeah, who's the we there? We became targeted. So, so, we, we, so during the kind of the initial stages of the internet that went, was coming to Iraq, before we didn't have internet, so before 2003, there was an intranet, which is really uh, kind of what's now was the same in North Korea, which is that there are only a few websites you can access and these are the states, states approved websites. And if you go somewhere else, uh, you, they might be able to track you and may be able to hunt you down. Uh, same with satellite television. Uh, so you have to hide the satellites in, like, in, the, in the house and that way. It, it reached the level, I mean, the last years of, of the regime, it reached the level in which even married people start being afraid of each other because like they have installed kind of a system in the head in which they're always reminded us that there's someone there's somebody in the intelligence somewhere so you have 1984 yeah so so you have to be constantly um 
watching yourself and all, watching your words and at the same time really be afraid of everybody. So after that, the then there was after like the fall of that kind of the collapse of that regime, um, it led to kind of create a movement of, of anti-authoritarians, mainly made of um, people who really lived under both of these both of these phases, but also mainly those who did, who were kind of more on the younger generation. And so um, this was not a particularly popular stance among those in power. So you end up on this death list. Yes. So so, so there are definitely there are some people who are not fans of <laughs> of my work. Um, and so I, I ended up on death list and many others. And then I had to leave the country. Um, I left to, to Lebanon, which is in the neighboring country of us. And the goal was I end up in the West. Um, and I applied for a visa to the United Kingdom after I got accepted for studies there. And unfortunately, they had a lot of restrictions on Iraqis. And so it was not an official travel ban, but the requirement that it would take so that, that's kind of the politically correct version of a travel ban in which you make it kind of very di dif difficult to enter the country. Just pile and up the hurdles to make it the, yeah. basically impossible. And I, I think it's that the, the entry was, you need to, I think it was like, you have to have 50,000 pounds or somewhere like that in the, in the, back, in the savings account, mm -hmm. untouched for X amount of months. Um, and then as a result of that, I, I kept getting refused. Um, and one of the people at the universities there were sympathetic and, they said, well, I mean, many of the British education is offered in Malaysia. And I've looked at your, your passport and the enter requirement for Iraqis. And it looks like Malaysia actually allows you to enter. And how about I just move your admission papers? And, and, and really, this is kind of a, a template that you should send around universities there. And you'll be accepted. And that's what happens. So I applied wow. uh, for universities in Malaysia, University of Sunway, uh, which is kind of a an international university. So Malaysia became like, and it is until today, it is kind of this like middle country between the third world and the first world. So there were a lot of immigrants from the Middle East who were studying in Malaysia. And then they go to like an Australian route, British route, American route, you get your education and then you apply for um, to, to go for another country. So they were like kind of a middle country. Yeah. And so in um, your case, you ultimately <laughs> took the US route. I, I, I took the U.S. route, yes, by through a different, uh, I mean, life definitely doesn't go straight forward. Um, so because I was, I was on a death list, um, that actually made me eligible to apply for refugee status because the kind of the requirement is that you have to have a threat in the, in the home country that you, you are in. And, and I applied through the United Nations, through the UNHCR, the United Nations Commission for Refugees. And... It is one of those things is that, and I think that's where like, I develop most of my resilience, um, is that they, the application, they tell you, oh, it takes somewhere between uh, six months to 10 years. <laughs> uh, that is the <laughs> That is quite a range. <laughs> it, is, it, is, it is a hell of a range. And, uh, and then you, you uh, I mean, uh, like you figure it out. And then um, I got accepted after three years. And then I came to the States in 2013. And as of Two years ago, uh, um, as of actually a year and a half, I've been a U.S. citizen. Wonderful. I, okay, so I love that story for a lot of reasons, in part because it also sets up the why for Ideas Beyond Borders. So at what point did you decide, you know what the world needs? We need this organization. And then what does the organization do and why did you start it? Yeah, so, so the why started really th during that, that era um, of, of post-Saddam Hussein, so post-2003. And I was, I mean, I still consider myself one of the f very few lucky ones who were taught English since a young age. So my, my parents taught me English outside the main education system, which, which is really terrible and mainly doesn't teach any, uh, any basics. So when I was kind of in that post-Saddam era, I, when the internet was kind of opening up, I look at the English internet and I look at the Arabic internet and they were completely different. And not only there is very little content in Arabic, there is very little factual content in Arabic. So in, in a way that most, I mean, now kind of things get better, actually to some extent because of my organization, but also other efforts happening, is that most of what was on the Arabic internet is either voices of extremism so these are people who 
most of the time, and, and, and unfortunately, Middle East like extremist groups are more institutionalized than they have channels and they have newspapers and, and they have more like a mainstream, um, not necessarily acceptance, but they have the ability to reach the mainstream more, much more than the, than the other side. So that was really, so look at, differentiate between that. And I was like, okay, so you go to an English internet and there's a lot of information about science, a lot of information about, about philosophy, etc. And then the Arabic internet is a huge contrast. And I've, since I was young, I, I, was, I was working on translation to really making uh, information uh, available, at least in my close circle and my friends, I've badly translated the Bill of Rights <laughs> um, into Arabic uh, when I was young and, and, and really kind of spread the, the word about it. And so that's really like kind of the why question is try, trying to make information and, and really knowledge accessible to people in the region. Yeah, so um, here you are. I mean, you're really young and you've got these magic lenses that most young people don't have where you obviously can read the Arabic and understand what's happening and you're able to read the English and you're, you're looking at these different sources and seeing really different messages. You realize early on that this is important and you start translating, including the Bill of Rights for your friends and this starts to, to plant the seed. Yeah, yeah. So that that was and 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 I've dealt with it, it been very passionate. And when I moved to to the to the states, uh, really, I, I was like, I mean, some of it can be attributed to survival guilt, <laughs> um, but some of it is is really the, the I would say the combination is like now now I'm in America now and I'm in a safer place. I can do things that people who are my age and also in my position in Iraq cannot do because of blasphemy laws and restrictions of freedom of speech, et cetera, et cetera, and really fear, fear for, for life. And that is where I was like, okay, I mean, somebody has to do it and why not me? Um, and, and, and really that's the, that moved me through the logistical part, which most of it happened through really a, a, a circle and, and a friendship that, that extended over years that, okay, I need, I need a lawyer. And then a, a lawyer right. goes up and then like all of the, um, all of kind of the logistics were all taken care of, and I just needed really to do to get the programs done and get the program done, and then do theory of change and, uh, and all of the fun stuff. And you know, I love <laughs> the theory of change and all the fun stuff. And so, at this point, a couple stats um, that I think really illustrate IBB's success: so, fifteen books translated, twenty thousand articles translated. 25 million words translated. So these are texts that have new ideas. They're translated into Arabic. And then what happens to them? So, you know, so they're translated. Who's reading So, um, so when I started Ideas Beyond Borders, one of the things I've, I've accomplished is, what I really, I'm really proud of, is the back to the bringing people together <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. approach is that there were many of, of the of social, I mean, sometimes can be called social influencers or people who have, really utilize social media for the good of spreading ideas. And what I, 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 I try to do and eventually accomplish is to get all of these voices under IBB and to use their social media presence under IBB. So as a result, we built a network of 4.5 million subscribers to all, all under the IBB umbrella. And so when the content gets created or, or translated in, in this regard, it gets shared to that at least the 4.5 million that exists within our kind of the direct beneficiaries of our content, as well as those who share the content and with their friends, etc. So just last year, uh, we had 45 million views on our video content. And I think about 60 million views for the articles. And the articles are, is in partnership with Wikipedia. So we're a partner of Wikipedia Arabic. And really how, how that happened was I saw an article that Jimmy Wells wrote, which was the founder of Wikipedia on, on a newspaper in, in the Middle East. And he was saying, kind of really echoing what I was talking about in kind of lack of Arabic content, et cetera. And then, and then I get an email of his assistant and I was like, hi, I think I can help, help solve this problem. <laughs> and uh, then we, as a result of that, and then we formed an agreement with the, with the local groups there. And now we have an agreement with the main foundation called Wikimedia Foundation. And uh, yeah, so that's where um, the idea of Wikipedia started, and, and then we have all of this content being uh, being read. And now we're actually experimenting 
with the concept of quizzes, um, of really figuring out, especially on the subject of critical thinking and media literacy, which is now became, becoming like kind of our main thing, um, is that we, we, we target again examples of people of misinformation, et cetera, after they get exposed to that, and then they take, they get informed by our content, videos or articles, and then we give them a quiz that are they now able to differentiate between X and between before reading our content, after reading our content. And that is something that I'm really excited about uh, because it's, um, I mean, I'm very familiar with the people. I mean, we get a lot of emails of people thanking us about the fact that we exist and our content is available. Uh, but one of the things that we'd love to really measure um, how much our, our impact and if there are ways also to improve it. So this is the, the 2021 goal is to really investing in uh, the metrics and the impact and figuring out like pre and post surveys and all of that yeah. stuff to, to see if, um, if, and if, if it works, uh, then we would love to share that with other nonprofits, other institutions who are also interested in the subject of education and really change of, of knowledge and change of behavior. Right. And, you know, having sat at the head of an organization, the first question most donors ask, um, as well as most partners, is what does success look like? How do you how do you know that you're having an impact? And if you're actually able to demonstrate empirically that people are able to process information differently as a result of having encountered your text, that's huge. Yeah, and that may qualify me for a Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> uh, I think it's but yeah, I mean, I, I think I think what, what was the answer for what success looks like is really, uh, I mean, I, I've written an article like long, maybe like 2011, and I said why, it, why it's easier to start a terrorist group in the Middle East than a liberal one. And I explained kind of the, the, the reasons why. Uh, and mainly is, is really the, the lack of funding is, is the main thing, but also the lack of organized structure for, 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 this main, for these ideas. And... I mean, success has been, for us, is, I mean, for me personally, but also professionally, is that to have that third voice. I mean, in the Middle East, we have kind of two, I'm afraid that's happening in the West as well, kind of to some degree, is that you mainly have the authoritarians and the extremists. These are the two dominant voices, um, and the, there is no third, there's no third way. And establishing the third way has always been kind of what I define success be like, is that you don't have to follow these two sides there is there is a different route that you can take and and um i mean i, I saw i saw in the elections i think in brazil the elections was was between like a communist the communist party and fascist party so so in a way is that it is it is not the um so middle east is not far is not different in that regard but really it's it's to find that there is a third path that people and and i mean really the the focus is really not to teach people what to think but how to think is that the moment we are able to provide people with the tools in which they can differentiate fact from fiction, then, then the, the likelihood of the propaganda and extremist narrative will actually decline. And as, yeah. that is really the kind of the left goal, the end, end goal. Um, but I think it's, it's, uh, it's something that really worth um, investing in and doing. I mean, I, I not just found, I mean, um, donors, but really, I mean, I, I'm a very data-driven individual, and I would definitely yeah. love to uh, be, make better decisions on, on on whatever data that we can gather. Right. So, I mean, it's not just that you need to have information available. It needs to be good information. It needs to be accessible. And people need to have the habits of mind to be able to make decisions and come to their own opinions and the freedom to be able to come to their own opinions and uh, on that information. Definitely. And, and I think, I think the, I mean, the, I mean, there's a lot of, kind of uh, negative PR happening on the internet these days, but- uh, Wait, what? I think there's a Wait, lot you're, of negative PR. You're shocking me here. What? <laughs> <I'm just joking. laughs> uh, and I think is, is that, it's especially in the kind of, um, in, in the Middle East context, I actually have a conversation with my friend at, at Google there. And it's like within the kind of free societies, the, the, and the, because there are there's such a thing as mainstream media and, and, and I think there's editorial boards and, and there are some free, a very significant freedom of press is that the alternative media in the state generally became a source of misinformation because really the, the kind of the institutions allow for fact-checking, allow for checks and balances. 
in the Middle East, most of the media is state controlled. So in a way, the alternative media became the source of facts. So there's kind of the reverse yeah. situation in which within like closed societies, the internet is really the place in which you can get information. And in the West where kind of it's the, 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 the state is, does not the one, is the one who controls the, the, the media. And, and there's actually no one controls the media. I mean, there's, it's a very complicated structure, but it, it makes the case that alternative, kind of the counterculture to that generally has been the source of, of, of uh, a lot of misinformation. It's kind of the opposite. Yeah, there's an inversion. Happening there. So, uh, so on the website, there are, I think, 14 strategic partners listed. And so, you know, as you can imagine, I'm very interested in this idea of interinstitutional, interorganizational um, collaboration. And I'm curious, what does it mean to be a strategic partner? How are these partners engaged in the work? And also, how does this work serve the needs and interests of the partners? Uh, you, you you definitely check the website. I love that. I, I love the fact that you really digged into the website. That's amazing. I prepared for our conversation. Cheers. That's, that's amazing. <laughs> um, so, I mean, all of the partners, so we have, so Wikipedia and Wikimedia Foundation is, I would say, is one of our largest partners, and that's where we do a lot of the work. The other partners are universities inside the Middle East, and now we are, we over the past two years, really, we have invested in this program in which we try to get the youth, especially the ones in, in colleges, to be part of our translation team. So in that way, we give them training. We give training to these students, give them workshops, introduce them to kind of the international scene, connect them to students around the world, et cetera. And also be able for them to be able to have conversations within a closed space. Um, and that, that hypothesis is now kind of improving in terms of, because now we have a close sample, small samples, we're now able to measure better. Uh, so building that university partnerships are, are very essential for us because this is, you can have a more control of the environment than our 4.5 million followers in which they come from very different walks of life and et cetera. So there's a lot of significant university partners that we have across the region. We're expanding that this year um, with kind of an emphasis on measuring critical thinking and, and how people can improve that, these skills. So these are kind of our main partners with Wikipedia and the universities. Um, what the, there, are, there are some networks that we became part of uh, that I think it's, it's now really bringing us a lot of benefit. There is one called Allies for Peace Building, which is one about organizations that try to bring peace to the world. I know that sounds like a very <laughs> generic mission, but it's really they try to bring, create the network of all organizations that focus on peace as, a, as the goal that they would like to have and really share best practices of kind of what, what these organizations are doing. So we're part of this network and they have regular events, et cetera. Um, we have uh, we, we come up net, part of, of the Progress Network, Progress Progress Network, which is I think a program of New America Foundation. Um, and that is focused on organizations that really following the Enlightenment Now hypothesis of Steven Pinker, which there, there's a lot of good being done in the world and that is not, not as mainly covered. And they try to bring all of the organizations that try to do good in the world. For some reason, we ended up there. <laughs> uh, so I think I understand why. Yeah. <laughs> so there's, there's that. Um, so I think these are the main kind of strategic partners that we have. Um, and it is really, a, I mean, a, a policy that I follow uh, well is, is that, yeah, we, we're, we, we, we always need partners. There are always places for us to learn from others and really see what they kind of the scene of, of the nonprofit scene uh, is doing and yeah, be part of, of a movement and not do uh, things all by, by ourselves. Yeah, yeah, not try to boil the ocean on, on one's own. Um, so, you know, I think in terms of collaboration, so you've got obviously inter-organizational collaboration, you're working across sectors. So you've got nonprofits, you've got, um, higher ed institutions, you've got media groups, you're also working across national borders. So here we are, ideas without, or ideas beyond borders, um, you're collaborating in all these different ways. What do you see as the, the challenges, but also the opportunities of doing so? Because this is hard what you're doing. Um, I, I mean, when, when you're doing the day-to-day, -day, sometimes you forget how much uh, hard it is. Um, I think I think it's, it's 
I mean, I mean, adding to that, also the corporate partners that, that mm -hmm. we have. Um, so no, I think is the, the main challenge is, and I think that is really kind of some of the nonprofit uh, is that some, many people take work, take too much work, eventually they're not able to do anything. So they do a lot of partnerships, they do a lot of, they, we, we do a lot of things and then eventually um, not able to do it well. So I think the, yeah. the main challenge really has been for me to constantly say no. Uh, to things that I know will probably will exhaust us and will not will, for us for us not to be able to achieve our mission. I mean, we ha we've got a lot of requests for us to open in different places, open new branches in areas in which technically I would need a clone. Um, like in, in, in for example, like in South America or even in, in Asia, etc. Is that um, so? Really. I think that the main challenge is that many people who are kind of very passionate eventually end up saying yes to everything. And as a result of that, they they spread too thin and not be able to achieve the main goal in which kind of the organization or the spirit um, started with. So that's yeah. really uh, and is the thing that I've kind of learned the hard way because I've been through uh, difficult partnerships that didn't work. Um, and then there are partnerships that work. So I think is that uh, I mean, my philosophy is like do one thing and do it really well versus try to do everything. And um, I think that's really the kind of the challenge that in nonprofit is that you're generally driven by the cause. There's kind of, there's less, less kind of the metrics that exist in the corporate world apply here. And as a result, I see a lot of like a uh, nonprofit go into a lot of partnerships and do, and do a lot of things and eventually um, it reaches a level in which they, they, they probably achieve less and, and be less productive. Yeah. So I, so a couple follow-up questions there. One, um, you mentioned that some collaborations or some partnerships have worked really well and some haven't. What have you learned about the, the early filters? So the things you can be asking yourself to evaluate the quality of a partnership before you get in too deep. And I clearly, one of them is the mission resonance piece that you're talking about. And then the other thing that I'm reminded of is this metaphor of water and that, you know, if you, if water left without any sort of channel just falls flat, I mean, it just spreads and spreads and spreads. Um, but when we offer channels, whether it's, you know, through the river or the canal, the water can actually be really forceful and have momentum and that sort of thing. So just, you know, I That's love a, a good metaphor. Example, yeah. Yeah. So, so I guess the actual question there is, uh, what have you learned about um, choosing your partners wisely? Yeah, the, the red flags. Um, I think is, I mean, I definitely like 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 the question at the end of many of these calls is that what are our roles and responsibilities? Uh, so the question of really designating what is exactly the partner should do and what are they expecting of us? Um, because there are, I mean, I've had a lot of conversations and the conversation comes in and ends and then there's like, oh, we should do a partnership. And then, okay, what does that even mean? Uh, and and um, so I've been through that. So that's actually how we started was generally we have a lot of these kinds of, let's have a partnership for the sake of partnership. Um, and really going into what is the roles and responsibilities of, um, of each organization. Um, something I have lear learned the hard way because it, there was this uh, formal agreement is that, oh, IV will do this and this will do this. And then eventually when I try to transform that to the staff, then I have to communicate what is actually the partnership is about. So then eventually <laughs> I put my staff in a lot of, uh, difficult positions um, and I, I take full responsibility because I was the one who, who get the partnership going, but then I'm not gonna be the one doing it. It's gonna be me delegating it to the staff and I'm not able to communicate what this partnership is about. Right. Um, and therefore, and then, and then the partner will start expecting things from us. Uh, and now I badly communicate it to my staff. So, that is <laughs> so, yeah. so I think, I think the lesson learned is, 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 uh, we need to communicate and to communicate better. Um, I'm now generally like taking notes, um, like in, in, in most of these meetings, uh, really kind of push back if I see, see that there's something my organization cannot do uh, or we don't really have the expertise to do. Um, and yeah, and so communicate better and, and really have 
very be very specific about the partnership uh, versus yeah. making it. Uh, so, like with these partnerships, the strategic partners that you, that I was mentioning, is that we have very specific thing we do with them, like with the universities, translation program, critical thinking, the Wikipedia translation, also uh, programs and editing. So, like very specific programs um, and a, a very specific tasks, and everything is on paper. So, in that way, it can be easily communicated to the staff. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah. What, so what, you've really put up made explicit this is what we're doing and it's within the context of this other relationship and I um, just recently actually posted an article on psychology today talking about this idea of where we so often that we'll all get together it's like you know what we I love what you're doing we should totally work together oh my gosh yeah we should do something together but that activation energy it takes to move from the idea of working together in concept to actually having a there there that's specific enough to pursue and to make forward momentum on in a way that's not just a resource dump, where if you really, you're not sure what we're talking about in our meeting, then getting together for that meeting feels like, or can feel like a total waste of time, especially when you are pulled in a million different directions. Um, so that, that really resonates with me in a, oh, I'm gonna forget his name, but a, a guy reached out on LinkedIn and shared the, the term co-blaboration instead of collaboration, which I really like that little turn of phrase. So I'm gonna learn more about that. Um, so last question here, what advice would you offer to nonprofit leaders who are themselves considering the merits of joining forces um, across or with organizations? What would you recommend as maybe a couple things to be aware of or a couple steps to make sure you take? I think, um being patient is a is a virtue um that it, like make sure that your programs are well designed and well taken care of before starting any partnership so in that way you'll be able to to communicate that uh well and people know exactly what you're doing um so i'm i'm, I'm as i said i'm a very big fan of partnerships and i think it's that our organization would not be what it is to be able to accomplish most of it, of its goals without our partnerships. Um, so, and not all, all partnerships are equal. So, I think being being uh, specific, being patient, change to, to create a program together takes a lot of time. It's not just one conversation. I mean, that's the activation conversation, which is very. It's always the most exciting part of the of the thing. Is that this first conversation is generally the, the most fun, and then yeah, and then, oh, I'm gonna do this thing. Yes, and and, that, and, and I think is that, I mean, I, I still I would say I have, I have an addiction to this to these first meetings because it really keeps, makes life going. Uh, because sometimes I also spend a lot of time on a lot of bureaucratic stuff, which I know needs to be done, but but it's not really what kind of keeps me always motivated. Yeah. So I think there is uh, there, there is a lot of room for, for partnership. Just make sure that you get your programs taken care of. Communication is very important. Know exactly what you need to do and and have a conversation about what do you need to do um, and form a partnership accordingly. I think it's, it's, it's very important to do it, um, but I think it's, it's just, uh, it's always to have uh, some, some tools and, and really some steps to make sure that this partnership goes in the right direction. Yeah, it's uh, so funny. So I'm a close relationships researcher by training. And as you're talking, what's echoing for me is like, that's exactly like in a romantic partnership where you need to have a strong self um, in order to partner, in order to pair and match effectively. So, you, you know, you just like gave me another frame there. So thank you. So thank you. what is the best way for people to connect with you and with Ideas Beyond Borders? So... Uh, I mean, that's, that, was a, that was a very pleasant interview. And I, actually, this is the first time I have a conversation that is specifically also a nonprofit. So I generally have conversations in many different directions. Um, well, I will share that at, around another margarita, like earlier, <laughs> years ago, we talked about theories of change and thinking about nonprofit development. So I was like, well, I'm going to take it in this direction. So thank you for, you know, going, going there with me. No, it's, it's a definitely a great direction. Um, I mean, ideas. I mean, ideasbeyondborders.org is our website. Um, it has a contact page and it has a, a semi-partnership page, which is uh, really how can people connect with us. So that's on an organization level. Um, I'm very active on social media. Maybe I should I should reduce that, but but I'm, I'm active on social media um, at 
F A I S A L A L M U T A R. So Faisal Motar. Um, it's on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Um, in fact, I think I think LinkedIn is is uh, thank goodness for the existence of LinkedIn is is able to kind of uh, finally there's a place that is only for for professional world, yeah. uh, while Facebook can sometimes go um, in, in interesting directions. So I think LinkedIn would be a very great place. And really, if people go to, I will send you my link tree, which has which links all of my uh, social media okay. and also my uh, website and everything. And I will put all of that in the show notes, as they say. Um, so thank you for, for being here, for being part of this interview, for sharing the idea of these interviews, and also just for your, your leadership out there and what you're doing to, to make this world a better place for all of us. And I'm just inspired and indebted. Thank you. Thank you. You're, you're making the world a better place too. So thank you.